consider the first four verses this evening. Then Jacob called for his sons and said, Gather round so I can tell you what will happen to you in days to come. Assemble and listen. Sons of Jacob, listen to your father Israel. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the first sign of my strength, excelling in honor, excelling in power. Turbulent as the waters, you will no longer excel, for you went up onto your father's bed, onto my couch, and defiled it. Now, this is one of the most fascinating chapters in what is arguably one of the greatest books in the Bible, the book of Genesis, to understand the rest of the Old Testament and the coming of the Messiah and the birth of the New Covenant Church and the whole world today filled with gospel churches. You have to understand what this chapter is talking about. Here is Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, and he's, uh, he's speaking. And what he says here in this chapter are the most important and significant words that he ever spoke in his life. Not all Jacob's words that have been preserved for us in the Bible are good words or helpful words. As a young man, he had spoken lies and deceit. But at the end of his life, Jacob had much to say that was remarkable. His last words were his best words. And every preacher in particular wants to be like Jacob, that his mouth and his faith become increasingly sweet and true and enduring as the end of his life approaches. The first thing I want you to see is the context in which Jacob spoke these words, and the context is one of urgency. You readily notice in the first two verses, the insistence of Jacob that his sons dropped everything that they were doing and all of them came together to hear his final words. He was a dying man. It was impossible for him to visit them one by one. So he insisted that they all came to him without delay. Leave your flocks and herds. You must even leave tending Pharaoh's sheep. Come from the fields of Goshen because I have something very important to tell you. And that's the refrain. See, in the opening verses, he called for them, we learn, and then he urged them, gather round. And he told them that he was getting them all together because he had something very important to say to them about their futures. And then he exhorted them even more, assemble and listen. And then he repeats the word, listen. You can feel his sense of, uh, of haste, he's getting frail, and he's longing for them now not to miss this, that it is crucially important that they heed it. There were no guarantees that he was going to have another opportunity to meet all of them. He was asking for their attention. He was frail and weak. So he said, gather round an assembly, please listen. He begged. He didn't want any one of them to turn up to listen simply to what he had to say to him, but he wanted him to listen to what all other 11 brothers had to listen to. And he wanted them to listen intently. So this was not an occasion for individual counseling. It was a public assembly for each one in the hearing of all his brothers to consider how God was going to deal with him and them in the future as children of this man Israel, Jacob, Israel. There come favored times in our lives when we must hear words which are of eternal significance to our souls, when the man speaking to us is in a spirit of deadly earnestness, and on those occasions elements of entertainment and humor are sheer distractions. That man will be contemptuous of them, intent on his hearers giving themselves to what he has to say when we gather on a Sunday morning at 10.30 and when we gather again at 6 o'clock. These are such important occasions. I could have used the words, these words of Jacob this morning when I spoke on the rich man and Lazarus and said to the congregation these words of verse 1, gather around so that I can tell you what will happen to you 
in days to come. What a tragic and unfulfilled life it is, never to know such moments, never to be addressed by the Ancient of Days. A new book appeared this week. It's a transcription of the beginning of the last series of sermons that Martin Lloyd-Jones preached at Westminster Chapel on the opening chapter of John's Gospel. And in the first congregation, I, the first sermon, he looked at the congregation and he said, the Christian church is not just a nice place and Christians are not meant to be just nice people. A Christian preacher is not meant to be a nice man who makes people feel a little more comfortable and happy while they are in a church. And yet that seems to me that is what is happening. Are you not appalled at the present state of the Christian church? Our ineffectiveness, the masses outside, the arrogance and the sin. What is the matter? Why don't people come to church? I must confess that I am convinced more than ever that they don't come because of what they see there. What they see is a number of nice people who seem to want sentimental and emotional comfort. That is what they see. But that is not the Christian church. No, the Christian church is meant to be an army with banners. Never was she so needed in the world as at the present time. That's what he says. That's very true. That's the spirit of Jacob here. He gathers together his sons in a spirit of deep earnestness and he addresses them all and he sketches out the future of each one of them. Secondly, I want you to see the nature of what he had to say. He gathered them, verse 1, so I can tell you what will happen to you in days to come. So this is not his last will and testament. They're not going to learn what possessions, what flocks, what portions of Goshen he has left for them or where they are to live in Canaan. Unless they realize that their father is leaving them a prophetic treasure and they are more than satisfied with that, then... Um, it would not be their hearing of a last will and testament. Jacob is going to speak to them about their individual futures immediately, but to, oh, in the distance too. Those last days, it's a phrase he uses. And what he tells them is certainly going to take place. No power in heaven or earth or hell can prevent what he says happening. The Lord Jesus uh, treated the twelve apostles in the same way. He told them what lay ahead. He told them there was going to be execution. And then he would rise on the third day. And that they too would expect, if they lived as he lived, that they would be harassed and tormented. But that the gospel would be taken to the ends of the earth until his return. And he spoke to them individually. He told Judas what he had to do, he had to do quickly. He spoke to Peter and warned him that Satan had him and was going to shake him and that he had to watch and pray. He spoke to Paul on the road to Damascus and told him what great things he must suffer for his sake. He gave them all details of what would happen at the fall of Jerusalem and until the end of the world. And we learn from that the nature of our futures that if we live as Christ lived and bear testimony to him we will know his blessing on our lives and that will be rich and we will also know the harassment and the hostility of a world that doesn't want Jesus Christ at all so I am saying to you it was not by wit or by ingenuity that Jacob spoke these words. He was in the spirit of prophecy. He was inspired by the Holy Spirit as he spoke to each one of them. The third thing I want you to see is the manner in which he spoke. Now, he generally addressed them in order of age. He started with the firstborn. But that is not rigidly maintained. It's the general pattern. But Zebulun is listed between Issachar, before Issachar, and Gad and Asher are listed between 
done and Natalie. It's not the exact chronological order, but that is the drift. Benjamin is the last, and then Reuben is the first. Then it seems to me that there were words of blessing that he gave to them subsequently. After he'd finished speaking those big words of prophecy in the hearing of them all, he went round them all and he talked to them one by one. And I get that from verse 28 at the end of the chapter where we read, this is what their father said to them when he blessed them. Giving each the blessing appropriate to him. Now NIV tends to suggest, I think from that translation, that uh, that, that is simply what... uh, uh, referring to what Jacob has said, words that you heard when I read the whole chapter to you. But I think um, then that having spoken to them publicly, he went round them. He spoke to them privately and he gave words of blessing. His blessing to each one of them. Then, And that has not been recorded. It's not necessary for us to know what he said to them one by one. Then you will notice this, that here is both the first and the last of certain actions. The first and the last are here in this chapter. The first is a line of Old Testament leaders who made significant speeches at the end of their lives. This is the first one. And then Moses did it, and Joshua did it, and Samuel did it at the end of their lives. Jacob's last words were distinctive because his congregation on this occasion were his own sons. So I'm saying this is the first example in the Bible of a man at the end of his life speaks his farewell words. But there is also here the last of something. It is the last of the great prophetic statements that you have in the book of Genesis. Genesis is full of prophecies. From the third chapter onwards, prophecies about the seed of the woman and and the seed of the serpent and the curse coming on the earth. Prophecies about uh, the world not being drowned again by a flood. Prophecies about the seed of Abraham blessing all the nations of the earth. And Genesis is as much a prophetic book as the book of Revelation. But this is its longest section of straightforward prophecy. You understand, he's not making educated guesses from his assessment of the different personalities of the boys and how he thinks it's going to work out for them one by one. What he says is incontrovertibly going to happen to each of them and their descendants in the future. This is it. In other words, what we have in this chapter is a confirmation of the greatness of our God. That he knows our future. That he knows our lives and our churches and of this world. He knows what's going to happen to this planet and this universe that he has created and that he sustains. He works all things after the counsel of his own will. God knows the future, but more than that, God plans the future. He doesn't just see how the ball is going to bounce. The whole trajectory of every bouncing atom has been determined by him. If there is one lesson that is paramount in the history of Joseph, it is that. And here, in this chapter, God is saying through Jacob, but it's not Joseph only whose life is planned by me. I've planned the lives of all his brothers also. And so he's driving this truth home, that he's guiding And ordering the smallest, the biggest events of our lives, he's ordered tonight. And the fact that you should come, and that you should hear this message, and I should have prepared it for you. And everything then that comes from this, and everything that will happen in the week to come. Then let me add another comment about this chapter. That we have here what I can call a retrospective 
and a prospective. And you, you're familiar with those terms? You have a retrospective of an artist's work, a poet's work, and so on. And then you have a perspective of what lies to come. So, in other words, Jacob looks back as well as he looks forward. These prophecies he makes often look back at what these men did with their lives. And he ruminates about their personal characteristics and personalities, deeds done, good deeds, evil deeds. And then the prophecies look forward, too, to their futures and their families and their descendants for generations to come. And the future will bring to fruition some of the tendencies that he has noted in his predictions, some of the future events, they will be consequences of deep flaws in their character. So just glancing through these predictions really shows us that uh, the greatest blessings then are going to be heaped upon two boys, Judah and Joseph. In spite of Judah's ugly sin with Tamar, God's blessing is going to be on him. There's very little space in this chapter for karma or fate to explain what happens in the future of these boys. It's not karma they're going to receive. It's going to be the will of God. And that is exactly what will happen for you and for me. God's power can always trump man's karma. There's nothing here that's going to deaden the faith of these boys uh, as they look to God and the things that come into their lives. They're never going to be saying, oh, well, that's my fate. That was karma. That was some other influence that came in. No, 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 no. They only received every day the providence of God. There was no que sera, sera here. Jacob's son Judah had been a stinker and yet he is not cast aside and he's not annihilated. Jacob announces Judah's going to be blessed and will be a blessing. And God's mercy can do that to men who have lived and behaved disastrously. So here we are listening to a man on his deathbed, a man who has met with God and heard the voice of God, and he's come to the end of his life and he gathers his sons around him. And under the guidance and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he is speaking to them as he has never spoken to them before. He should have spoken to them before. It would have been better for them and richer for them if he had spoken to them before as he speaks to them now. It is very late in the day, but it is not too late for him to address them. He is about to shuffle off this mortal coil, but the Spirit of God upholds him and plans all this and brings his boys to hear what he has to say to them. Some of the things are cutting. He cuts them down. But other things, he says, they're going to be rescued. I need to, see, need to say one thing more then as I explain to you the overall view of this chapter. That's what I'm doing. This is the introduction. You understand that now. And I want to say something about the style of this chapter. You will notice that it is poetry. You notice that, don't you? Straight away from your new international version, translation, it's printed out quite well as poetry, isn't it? Every prophecy that he makes to the boys, he makes it in poetry. Most of the prophecies of the Old Testament, as you know, you flick through uh, the prophecy of Isaiah, it's all poetry. Just some sections of historical interruptions. The prophets did this to give beauty uh, and to make words memorable. To make them stick. And so you will find in, in this chapter then, in these words to the twelve sons, all the devices of Hebrew poetry. You will see parallelism. 
You will see antitheses. You will see synonyms. You will see a play on words. A man's name is taken. And then, ah, we know what that name means. And he says things about his name. And he gets a lesson from it for you. There is literary beauty here. There's an aesthetic sense that shows you the remarkable man Jacob was. That he could speak like this without any notes. That he could talk poetically and prophetically to his sons. And the poetry is vivid. The imagery is concrete. Five of the sons are compared to animals. Judah is a lion. Issachar is a donkey. Dan is a serpent. Naphtali is a deer. Benjamin is a wolf. Joseph is not compared to any animal at all. He is compared to a branch on a beautiful vine. And Reuben is compared to turbulent water. There are 11 parts to these benedictions because Jacob has already adopted and blessed the two sons of Joseph earlier. Levi is a tribe of priests. It doesn't have any land. It depends on the giving um, or the Levitical prescriptions for the support of the Levites. Um, so he is connected with another son in the ben benediction. He is connected uh, early on with Simeon. I think it's the next uh, prophecy. And that keeps the number down to 11. That is the end of what I want to say to you in introducing this chapter to you, this much-neglected chapter, neglected by me. The fourth thing I want you to look at now is the prophecy that Jacob made to Reuben. Verses 3 and 4. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the first sign of my strength, excelling in honor, excelling in power, turbulent as the waters, you will no longer excel. For you went up onto your father's bed, onto my couch, and defiled it. Three things. Firstly, Reuben's life began in hope. He became a dad. He held in his arms his own son. The wonder of begetting a child, and it was healthy, and it was there with him. Fully formed, breathing, moving. He looked at his baby son. He was filled with joy, filled with thanksgiving. Reuben was strong. He was crying for food. He had the privilege of being Jacob's firstborn son. Reuben, you are my firstborn. The first sign of my strength, excelling in honor, excelling in power. Those of you who have had the joy of parenthood or especially of fatherhood are able to understand the exuberance of the memory as he speaks uh, at this time to Reuben. He could look back over the years and know, my name has been perpetuated. The promised line of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob is going to continue. This is the one in whom the first sign of Jacob's virility and might appeared. Maybe this boy would be the one through whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed. It was his firstborn. Would he be the promised one? Would he be him? What an honor that would be. And so the birthright belonged to Reuben. Of course, the firstborn. Of course, he would excel. You notice how Jacob says that twice. That is, he would receive double the honor of the others. When the inheritance came, firstborn received half the whole inheritance. Um, even though there would be 11 others who would also have a share, a length of the half that remains. Reuben was the firstborn. And he had the potential of excelling in power and honor. Would it be Abram, Isaac, Jacob, and Reuben? A grand line of patriarchal leaders who loved and served God. Reuben would receive a lion's share of honor. And so he, he held his firstborn son, Reuben. It was an extraordinary ego-reinforcing event 
in his life, he'd become a father. Yet even then, all was not well. Jacob had married two sisters, and they were in rivalry with one another. And Reuben's mother, Leah, was able to conceive effortlessly. But not Rachel, the wife whom Jacob adored. Leah was neglected, but uh, she became the mother of his firstborn, and his secondborn, and his thirdborn. And here was a family whose path was going to be stormy and full of tensions. It was a family of bargaining. I'll do this for you if you do this for me. So Leah thought, now I have conceived a son for Jacob. My husband will love me from now on. Sounds like today. A couple move in together. But uh, the guy is reluctant to commit. And the woman is uncertain of his love, but she thinks, if I bear a child by him, then uh, he will love me. The boy will bring us together. He will be the link of love, rather than the fruit of love. And that was the kind of reasoning that Leah employed. Hasn't died out. It's on the wine, and it's in Pemparkai, and it's in the town, and it's on the earth. And it's on the villages round about 4,000 years later in Wales. People are in what they call relationships. And there's nothing legal about them. And there is nothing written down except when a boy is born and then names are written down. Children are very dangerous possessions. And that is what Jacob experienced how dangerous Reuben was, because soon he didn't have a boy or a teenager. He had a man under his roof, a man who never got beyond childhood. Reuben was, he says, the beginning. He was the foretaste of his father's strength and might. And hopes. But it never got off the ground. It was always the beginning. It was always the start. Reuben was not in it for the long haul. And so dying Jacob comes to his father Reuben. Uh, comes to his son Reuben all these years later. And he says to him. Reuben you were the beginning. Of my strength. And yet Reuben never got the birthright even though he was the firstborn and his father's early delight. It was not given to him principally because he violated the common law wife of his own father. He had relationships with Bilhah, his half-brother's mother. What was she? Well, she was a mere servant and he was the firstborn son. This wretched child thought and strutted. That was the man who was Jacob's boy. He broke his father's heart. The boy in whom he had such hope. He says, verse 4, You went up onto your father's bed, onto my couch, and he defiled it. You can see him, can't you, turning to the other 11 boys and saying to them, Onto my couch. The son in whom his hopes had been focused. Reuben was a boy with no morality. And the kind of morality that isn't even mentioned among the heathen. That was Jacob's firstborn. He was not going to inherit the privileges of the firstborn. He was not going to be the one through whom the promised seed would be born, who was to bless the nations. Oh, Reuben! Oh, Reuben, you were my strength. You were the beginning of it, my might. And all the things that went with it, my rejoicing. And look at your life. You could have excelled. But he says, see the play on words? You didn't excel. You're not going to excel. So he spoke to Reuben, and under the inspiration of God, the Holy Spirit, he told him he would not have the preeminence. The blessing would be taken from him. 
because of the way he'd behaved and the way he lived. He hadn't observed God's laws. He hadn't shown love and honor to his father. He had been covetous. He had been full of vain ambitions. He felt, if I can take my father's concubine, then my place will be absolutely unchallengeable in leadership amongst these brothers of mine. It was not the way of God's blessing. You will no longer excel, verse 4, said his father. Not now, not after that. There was a curse in Jacob's words to Reuben. And these words ever stand over those who practice that kind of immorality. They live under a curse. His life had begun with such hope. A man holding in his arms his own son. But tensions between the wives spoiled it and shadows deepened as Reuben robbed himself of the blessing. By living to himself. He robbed his posterity of the great blessing of the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob because he defiled a bed. The second thing I want you to see is how Reuben's life developed in folly and compromise. How did it go on? Well, you know, you remember. It's wonderful to have the rehearsal of this story that we've been looking through. So fascinating in these last months. You know this man, his heart was as turbulent as the waters. You see that image? It wasn't like a rock. The waves come crashing in, the storm comes, the rock is unmoved by it. But the waves, the water, it just needs wind blowing it. It'll go this way, and it'll go that way. That was this boy. So be warned then you who, upon whom the end of the ages come. How is your life going to develop? He was a man standing before his father. Absolute silence. All the boys listening quietly. What is dad going to say? And he speaks firstly to Reuben. Reuben, a man governed by instinct, governed by the flesh, a man with few principles, a man of compromise. So a day came when his younger brother Joseph sent on a message, oh, almost a hundred miles, to go and see how the brothers were doing. And they see him, a little speck, and they know straight away who it is. And they despise him and they hate him. Because uh, the favorite position he has and the lovely coat of many colors that he has, they can see him in that coat as he comes towards them. And because of the dreams that he has so artlessly told them, about a time when they will bow, all of them bow, father and mother and all of them bow before him. And they're a hundred miles from home. And when men are far from home, they do wild things. And all the brothers disdained the dreamer who spoke of them all bowing to him. And their rage overflowed. We can kill him now, they said. They hated him that much. They would murder their brother. They would practice fratricide. But Reuben was the oldest. And Reuben was the firstborn. And Reuben had leadership. And Reuben had a duty to perform. And he knew his father's love to Joseph, Rachel's son. And he knew the commandment, you shall do no murder. So what does he say? No, let's not slay him, let's throw him into a pit. It was a wretched compromise, wasn't it? Resisting killing him or beating him up, but suggesting giving him a lingering death of starvation in a pit. And he thought, well, I can go back and release him later on. He didn't stand, you see, and say, what are you thinking about? You're not going to lay a finger on this boy. You will do no violence to him whatsoever. Let me know. I'll never hear you speak like that again. I'll give my life rather than see one of these 12 boys, any one of you, killed. Didn't say that. He said, um, let's kill him slowly. He'll die when we're far away. And though we are told that Joseph shouted from the pit, 
and cried for them to deliver. They all sat down and had a meal together. They ate their lamb chops. Reuben was a man who lived for himself. He was a man of compromise. He, he didn't seek the welfare of the kingdom. And that is what lies before us here in Scripture. He's a moderate between good and evil. A, a moderate between truth and error. A moderate. You remember another incident in his life where, again, he poses as a self-sacrificing hero. Joseph, the prime minister of Egypt now, has demanded that uh, before Simeon can be released from prison, uh, the youngest boy, Benjamin, must be sent down. And they've returned the boys without Simeon from Egypt, and they've told their father that he must release Benjamin to go down with them in order to obtain the release of Simeon. Or they'll never see him alive again. He's in prison there. And old Jacob is in terrible agony because he's lost Joseph. And now he's lost Simeon. And now they're asking him to give up Benjamin, the only other child of Rachel. And you know, he's, in, he's torn. He's in agony. And Reuben speaks up. You remember Reuben speaking up on this occasion. Do you remember what he said to his heart-sick father? He says, I look after Benjamin in Egypt. And if I fail to bring him back, you can kill my two sons. What an idiot! What an ignorant oaf of a man Jacob's firstborn son turned out to be. He actually thought that by giving his father permission to kill his two sons, that he would guide the old man into letting Benjamin go. Reuben had the mind and the morals and the heart of a child. He was thinking, I'll be a hero if I bring Benjamin back, and if I fail to bring Benjamin back, I'll still be a hero because I was willing for my two boys to be killed by my father. He didn't say, I'll go there, and if he won't let him go, I'll stay there. And I'll spend my days in Egypt that Benjamin can come back to you, Dad. He didn't say that. And you remember how Joseph pleads, how uh, Judah pleads when they find the cup in Benjamin's uh, sack and they take them all back. And how Judah pleads, I I'll, be, I'll be a slave for you. He says to Joseph, for the rest of your days, but it'll break my father's heart if Benjamin didn't go back. He's lost his brother. Don't let him lose Benjamin too. I'll take his place. I, I won't go back. I'll stay and slave for you. That was the voice of Christ, wasn't it? Here, yeah. Jacob knew Reuben. Jacob knew Reuben. He just seen and heard the most shocking and stupid things from his firstborn boy. He knew how turbulent, how impetuous, how indecisive, how failing to act when he should have, and how he spoke when he should have been silent. I'll show you one more thing. You might want to turn to Judges chapter 5. We are zooming 500 years later now. And uh, I want to show you the legacy that Reuben's character left to the tribe of, of Reuben. And how that fifth chapter is Deborah's great song. Her great poetry triumphing over the, the Canaanites in their great victory. And in that psalm she starts to mention the tribes that didn't take part in the battle. The tribes that failed to stand up and take out their swords and their pitchforks and their slings and count for Jehovah. And she mentions in verses 15 and 16 in Judges 5, she mentions the descendants of Reuben in the districts of Reuben. There was much searching of heart. Why did you stay among the campfires to hear the whistling for the flocks? In the districts of Reuben, 
There was much searching of hearts. I said, what do we do? Well, on the one hand, I suppose we could go and fight. And then on the other hand, there are the flocks, and somebody's got to look after the flocks, haven't they? Others can fight. We're undecided about these battles. Some of us think it's a proper thing to do, to drive the Canaanites out, and others think it's not. Others think the sheep come first, the Reubenites. The yokels from the tribe of, you, of Reuben having a, a discussion around the campfire as they eat their lamb chops and decide who should not fight. It's all, you see, uh, it's all a problem of guidance. But it was not a problem of guidance, and it rarely is. It was a problem of obedience to what God had said. You see, slip back to how this book of Judges begins. Look at the opening verses of the book of Judges. 1-1. One, one. After the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord, who will be the first to go up and fight for us against the Canaanites? The Lord answered, Judah is to go. I've given the land into their hands. Then the men of Judah said to the Simeonites, their brothers, come up with us into the territory allotted to us to fight against the Canaanites. We in turn will go up with you into yours. So the Simeonites went with them. When Judah attacked, the Lord gave the Canaanites and Perizzites into their hands and they struck down 10,000 men in Bezek. God had guaranteed them the victory. The land was going to be theirs. God had made up his mind. Who would not fight? If you knew you were on the winning side, victory being assured, war with the Canaanites was not a matter of discussion around the campfires. It was a matter of obedience. So we are told when the Reubenites were still debating that the people of Zebulun were risking their lives. And Jael, the wife of Heber, had killed the Canaanite king, Sisera, with a, a tent pole and, and a tent peg and a hammer. She was more decisive than Reuben's boys. They stayed with the sheep, talking it all, the whistling for the ewes to come down into the pens for the night. He wouldn't take his place among the tribes of Israel, fighting to gain possession of the promised land. Let Zebulun take the risk. It's better that I stay at home. When there was a choice between sacrifice or comfort, Reuben chose comfort. So what do we find in the remainder of the Old Testament? We find this. Not one priest. Not one judge. Not one prophet. Not one warrior. Not any leader comes out of Reuben. The line of Reuben doesn't consist of brave men who sacrifice themselves for truth and righteousness and obedience. They don't take up their cudgels and their slingshots for any cause. It's the kind of man Erasmus was when Erasmus uh, wrote uh, uh, a letter to Luther and he said, I'm not made of the stuff of reformers. I'm not made of the stuff of reformers and those who suffer persecution. I'm not made of that stuff. He acknowledged it. He was a scholar. There are pastors who study and read and write but they are not up on their feet in general assembly. They're not calling the immoral and the heretic to account. Everything for a peaceful life, they say. They're not made of the stuff of martyrs. There was no place for Reuben and Reubenites and his line in Israel. People of God need to be stronger men, not chocolate soldiers. Young men who don't bow to an idol and are prepared to be thrown into a burning fiery furnace because they won't bow down to idols. We will serve God alone. And this is the way, as the prophet says, the way the twig is bent is the way the tree will grow. And if you begin to live like Reuben, you are good for nothing. You are no good to the world because you are too religious 
And you're no good to the people of God because you're not religious enough. Reuben's life. It followed from his beginnings then. It was not a hopeful life. And lastly, Reuben sought his own life. Jesus taught us that if we were to save our lives, we have to lose them, regardless. And the direction of Reuben's life was one that despised the Christ of God and the church of God and the cross of God. He wanted to save his life by uh, sexual abandonment, save it from frustration. He was lord in his house, builder was a mere slave. He will save himself from sacrifice by big words and big gestures. Go ahead and kill my two sons. And by religious discussions went on and on and on. Good with words. That was Reuben. And withdrawing from God-ordained conflict. The followers of Reuben are talking still. There was a woman and when she came to B.B. Warfield... It was the week before General Assembly, and she said to him, Oh, I hope there'll be peace in the General Assembly. It was a deeply divided General Assembly as the modernists were taking over, were bent on taking over the UPUSA. She said, Oh, I hope there will be peace in the General Assembly. And Warfield said, I hope there will be a good fight. A fight for religious standards and a fight for truth. And ancient Deborah sings of the triumph of the people of God. Where were you, Reuben, when we needed you? And there's a kind of life that overlooks the Sermon on the Mount. And Romans 12 and the last chapters of Colossians, it overlooks it. It plays down the example of walking in the steps of Jesus Christ every day. How can I profit without cross-bearing? How can I be a Christian and yet get away with it in the world? And that is a life that despises the man of sorrows. Reuben was a law unto himself, and he did what he pleased, and he forfeited his birthright. And if you want to save your life by doing what you choose, you're going to lose your life. It'll be a wasted life. You will lose the purpose of living. You will lose any usefulness in the kingdom of God that you could have. So I look at Reuben's pathetic life. And I look at his followers in the line that was influenced by him. And I often see myself there, standing in the line with Reuben and his boys, his sons and his heirs. And I ask then, is there any hope whatsoever? Reuben didn't count for the Lord. And the tribe of, of Reuben made no influence to the people's triumph there. They didn't give backbone to the people. They were responsible for the whinging in the wilderness and the 40 years of self-destruction that they went through. Then I look at the book of Revelation and I look at chapter 7 and I read there in verses 4 and 5 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel 12,000 were sealed from the tribe of Reuben. That's what I read. Reuben and the Reubenites sealed by God. And I read in Revelation 21 that on the gates of the holy city, Jerusalem, were written the names of the 12 tribes. Of Israel. Reuben's name. There it is. I see it. On those great pearly gates. North and south and east and west. Reuben's name is there. And I see. Ah. There is hope. For sinners. Even sinners as bad as Reuben. Because they can grow up. And they can mature. And they can repent. Repent. 
in sorrow and heartache for their ugly behavior. And they can cast themselves on the mercy of God. And the final message I bring from this first word to Reuben is the word, do not despair. This is initially a sorry tale of a believer who compromised with the Lord and his word. He came out of the house of Jacob. He was a grandson. Of Isaac, a great grandson of Abraham. A boy so favored greatly. And he went astray. But in the end, in the end, he had changed. He stood in solidarity with Judah when Judah pleaded. When he spoke on behalf of all of them, and all of them had been humbled so greatly now, and were conscious of how wickedly they had behaved. God has uncovered your servant's guilt. We are now your Lord's slaves. We ourselves, he said on behalf of Reuben, he said it. And there was no bluster. There was repentance and there was shame. And there was reconciliation with Joseph, the brother much sinned against. When Reuben said, throw him into the pit. So it will be with you. Maybe you've sinned like Reuben. Maybe worse than Reuben. But when he humbled himself and repented of his heart sins, God made himself known to him. God wrote his name on the gates of heaven. God sealed him with the Holy Spirit. Old Reuben, ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. The old Reuben became a new Reuben. It's a great hope that we serve the God of Reuben, the God of Jacob, the God of Isaac, the God of Abraham. Christ receiveth sinful men, for them he came. And those he seeks today, he shed his blood for sinners like Reuben. Make him your God. Make sure he's your God. O oh, Reuben. Oh, Reuben, make sure the Lord is your God. Lord, bless your word now to us tonight. Warn us. Take heed, you who stand, lest you fall. And with your warnings, give us encouragements of the vastness of your mercy. Help us, Lord, we pray, for we are weak, but you are mighty, and you are compassionate and loving. So please hear our prayers that all of us, Reuben, like sinners, may come to know you, our Savior. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.